it was also a dream of all the promoters that we should have a listed platform. So, so talking about the real estate sector, real estate sector has a very high gestation period in terms of time as well as the money involved. No matter what, your prices may go up, your prices may go down, you may be suffering losses in some, you will make money in some. But at the end of the day, you have to have the ability to stand and say, we will deliver private equities. Yeah. Your shares got listed rounds. at a 60% premium back then, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, was, that was another story. As of quarter 1, financial year 2025, this June, your order book stands at 8800 crores. What percentage of this order book do you see materializing in let's say one to two years? Hi everyone, today we are at Capacity Infra Projects Limited in Gurgaon. Any construction slash infrastructure company can be divided into three segments that is residential, commercial and industrial. We have seen a significant uptick in the share prices of these companies given the infrastructure boost that the economy is getting. We have with us Subir Malhotra, Executive Director at Capacity Infra Projects Limited to discuss everything about the sector and where is the company and sector headed to. Thank you for joining us today, sir. Thank you, Anshul. Great to have you guys over from Green today. Thank you, sir. So before discussing business or sector or economy, we would like to know more about you. So from what I understand, you have done your graduation from a reputed institute like Bits Pirani. So how has the journey been for you? So I graduated uh, now, well, I can say way back in 88 and I'm, uh, I did my schooling from DPS Archipurum and then I went to Bits Pirani where I did my civil engineering and then uh, post that I worked in a few companies for a couple of years and then uh, around about 91 I started doing something of my own. It so happened that uh, all the present promoters of the past day kind of uh, got together and started focusing on some projects and some works together for in different ways for different people. So, as they would say, God willing, around about 2012, we all got together and said, let's do something on our own together. And that's how capacity came. So it's a short little brief. Yeah, your uh, educational background is very aligned like in terms of you have done civil engineering and now you are working in a uh, construction, construction company. company. So how was the scenario back then and how was the feeling when the IPO came in in 2017? So uh, first part of the question is, um, you know, I now feel I am doing more civil engineering than what I was doing 30 years ago. And uh, I also now feel, I mean, I may be digressing a wee bit, that education and what the industry demands are not aligned and this is something that i really want to get and focus myself into civil engineering is being taught something else in colleges and even in the good ones teach something else and the industry demands something else and so at some point of time there you know uh, needs to be some kind of matching of the demands of the industry but having said that i am uh, now um, happy to say that i'm working like a civil engineer Mm. And uh, the second part of the question. So 2017, when we did our IPO, we had actually gone to uh, a couple of private equities. Yeah. Your shares got listed rounds. at a 60% premium back then, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, was, that was another story. Yeah. But we had two rounds of private equity from uh, uh, HDFC Bank to private equity mm. people. And 2017, we decided that we wanted to get listed. It was also a dream of all the promoters that we should have a listed company. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of uh, reputation that you bring to the table when you meet people. It's the kind of uh, uh, powers that you can do bigger works when you mm -hmm. talk about them with the banks, financial institutions, etc. So that was a big uh, factor amongst the bigger factors for us to get listed. We were amongst the highest oversubscribed IPO at that time of oh. history in the city. Now there are others, mm -hmm. but till that time we were over for oversubscribed almost 300 times. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a very nice feeling. 
and uh, things were going great. IPO was a good, uh, you know, pat on the back, a recognition by the industry, a recognition by the bankers, a recognition by the people at large that yes, we were doing good work. Mm. Right now, there are a lot of infrastructure companies in India. Mm. So what do you think was starting business in 1980s way easier than what it is today? Or is it the vice versa case? So I tell you what, capacity, you may say as much, was actually started in a garage. There were three of us who sat down in one room. The first day we sat down amongst the three of us, we were looking at the other what will we do and uh, you all were working in different companies back we all were working in different companies okay. in different roles rohit was the finance guy rahul was a construction guy mm -hmm. i was also a construction guy so we kind of got together so when we got together one day and said we would do it we actually went back ground floor garage and we sat down there and let's start capacity mm -hmm. i said Ab kya kare? So then we all went back and said, okay, whom do we know? So there were people in the industry, specifically the real estate industry, that we knew very well, who said that we can give you work because we know Rohit, we know Rahul slash Subir. Mm. And that is how the first work started coming to us. You compare it with what happens today, is that I would say the face value of the people who are actually going to stand at the front and deliver is what is going to count. You have to have a reputation of wanting to deliver, mm. no matter what. Your prices may go up, your prices may go down, you mm. may be suffering losses in some, you will make money in some. But at the end of the day, you have to have the ability to stand and say, we will deliver. Yeah. So in the private sector, that is what counted. But as the journey moves on, to get into where the major business today is coming from is the public sector slash the government sector. There you need to go through the grind, you need to go through the smaller job, you need to go to the next bigger job, you then need to go to the next bigger job because that is how the uh, pre-qualification uh, you know, rules are there and I am not saying they are at fault, that is how they have been framed and that is how they have to be followed. Mm. So uh, speaking now, we are very well qualified for almost all the biggest jobs of the country mm -hmm. today and i would say this journey of the last 10 12 years has been really very yeah important. there's this good saying that investors invest in people and people bring culture and that is why so the company that very right yeah. so i would i would i would greatly say that the first few jobs i would say that the first few years of the jobs that we got were all given at face value mm -hmm. i was I was at a point where, you know, people were giving us 200 crore jobs at that point, 150 crore jobs at that point. And you would come out and say, okay, this has just been given because he knows this person can deliver. So they are trusting more. Absolutely. Yeah, they are trusting more, you more than the company. Yes, okay. and that is how it was. Yeah, yeah. That is how it is always. So, uh, as I told earlier, any company can be divided into, any construction company can be divided into three segments, residential, industrial and commercial and your company is into all three. So if you can give us a brief about all three segments and what are your revenue contributions from each of them. Okay. So, Hachal, we are what we classify ourselves as a BNF company. A okay. BNF company is a buildings and factories company. Okay. Now, companies like LNT have a vertical for B and F. Mm -hmm. We are only a B and F company, okay. which means we construct only buildings and factories. And if you look at them in the bigger picture, they are only buildings. Even a mm -hmm. bigger factory is only a building. Mm -hmm. Now, the buildings can be classified as residential, commercial, uh, industrial, mm -hmm. retail, hospitality, uh, health, the works. So if you look at how we are actually positioned, we are a building construction company. Mm. These are the various segments that we construct. We do works for commercial, retail, health, uh, hospitality, the works. So revenues are from our point of view divided into just two segments. Okay. One is segments coming in from private sector. 
and one is okay. a segment which is coming in from a public slash. So there's no sector. definite split between the commercial industry. And well, we have not really umbrella. done that. We yeah. have not really done that, hmm. and we have not felt the need to actually say, okay, let us get more commercial buildings mm-hmm. and let us do less residential buildings, because to a large extent, our work at the core remains the same. Yeah. So. Um, why we do tend to divide it amongst public sector and private sector is that the way jobs are actually constructed, the kind of jobs that are actually constructed are absolutely different. Yeah. So you won't have a uh, you know company majorly in the government sector not doing you know mm-hmm, retail. Mm-hmm. That is not where yeah. they are. But yes, you would have retail coming in mm-hmm. greatly from the private yeah. sector. So we have these two segments. Today, we say that we are around about close to 70% from the government sector yeah. and 30% from retail, from the private sector. Yeah, uh, we'll address the segregation later. And so when we, try, when we talk to any promoter or any company, we try to understand their value chain. Mm-hmm. Like how does the process work? Is it like you are constructing a building and selling it in your own name or is it like companies like Godrej or Broy are giving you their tenders and orders and you are making the projects for them. So how does the entire thing work? Great question. It's okay. So this is actually you know, what I wanted to get back to college and tell some of the guys over there about how this value chain works. So what happens is that we are what is termed as a contractor. Okay. Now a contractor is asked to bid hmm. for jobs, say for a residential job or say for a hospital or say for a airport or say for a railway station, we bid for a job. Mm-hmm. The value chain, as you said, is completely different for a private sector and for a government sector. Okay. okay. So now let me take two minutes and explain both of them yeah. separately. What happens in the private sector? A, the private sector has its own uh, pressures okay. of delivery today. Mm-hmm. They cannot have a mall, invest huge money in it and not get it operational. Mm-hmm. They cannot make a residential building mm-hmm. and not get it operational. There are, you know, government rules of RERA, etc., etc., yeah. which now force the developer to make sure that he delivers on mm-hmm. time. So the private sector's pressures are different. Okay. The private sector, though they might give a tender to you, mm-hmm. but they will see what kind of equipment you have. They will see what kind of ability to deliver that you have. Mm-hmm. And yes, there is a tender, then they will negotiate on that tender with you okay. and they will award that tender to you. Mm-hmm. What happens in the government sector? The government will take out what is called a pre qualification or a notice inviting a tender. Okay. That is their standard mm-hmm. process for years. They will take out an NIT, which mm. NIT may likha hoga that you should have done one job of 80%, okay, two okay. of 63, mm-hmm. or something like that will be mm. written over there. You should have done something similar mm-hmm. like this kind. And once you get to that point of time, you are, so to speak, pre-qualified to do the okay. job. Now, very interestingly, what has happened over the last four, five, six years is that the government has changed the way it is wanting people to bid for these tenders. Okay. It is now coming out in what is called an EPC mode. Okay. So earlier what used to happen was you want to construct a building for a come for a government office mm-hmm. and someone will take out a tender and that mm-hmm. tender will be some rate somewhere and you mm-hmm. keep on bidding and all of a sudden uh, there are time overruns, there are cost overruns, mm-hmm. there are design changes happening mm-hmm. over all that. Now, the new rules in this government policies are, here is a set of drawings. Okay. Give me one price for it. Okay. This drawing ke under, jo kuch likha hai, wo sab aapko karna hai. This drawing me likha hai, waha pe tile laga nahi hai, aap tile laga lena. This me likha hai, waha granite laga hai, granite laga hai, fan likha hai, fan laga hai. Whatever is written in this set of drawings, you do everything. Hmm. I don't know how many fans you have to put. It's there in the drawing. You calculate it yourself. Mm. How many walls thicknesses you have to do, you calculate it yourself. Mm. And it has to be done as per the drawing and as per the codal requirements of the government. Okay. So there's a set of codes, mm-hmm. IS codes. Mm-hmm. 
so you have to make a slab which has to have as much thickness yeah. as much steel etc mm -hmm. etc et et so now the whole system of bidding for the government sector has changed onto an epc mode okay you get a set of drawings you give me one price mm. whoever is the lowest mm. takes the work okay so it is an l1 mode in which there is a sort of a pre-qualification that is okay. done. Mm. They would like to say, okay, someone who has constructed only X amount of highways cannot build a building. They may do that. So it's just a screening process. It's just a screening yeah. process. So they get people with required caliber mm -hmm. of pre-proven caliber to bid for that job. Okay. That is what is there in the NIT. Mm. Then you get a set of drawings and you bid for the set of drawings. One job, one value. And you may bid 500 crores for the same job, you may bid 800 crores for the same job, you may bid 200 crores for the same job, but you bid one price. Sir, coming to this, uh, this is the government sector. How do you bid for projects in private sector? So, do you think the private sector is more sort of relationship based project getting business, or is it like, okay, private companies are also floating the tenders and you are bidding for it? So, a lot of this. As you rightly said, the screening process hmm. is done by the private sector developer. Okay. Assume you are a private sector developer, hmm. you have this humongous residential complex that hmm. you have. Today. So you will go out into the market and see who are the people who have done good, decent residential complexes as a contractor. Hmm. You will find there are some, given your size of the project, you will find X number of people who will do that job. Hmm. So like you said, the screening process happens over there. Okay. Then there is a tender. Hmm. No doubt there is a tender. In private sector? In private sector also. Okay. There is a tender which will hmm. BOQ, bill of quantities which will come out, set of terms and conditions will come out. The developer can pay within 30 days or he will say I will pay in 7 days or I cannot pay before 60 days. Mm -hmm. And whatever his terms and conditions you meet. But in the private sector because of the relationships that you may have, because hmm. of your previously proven calibers that you may have, mm. those things are still open for discussion. Okay. Okay. You may say, sir, I don't need a, I need at least a 10% advance. 5% se mera kaam nahi chalega. And then the developer is willing to listen to you. Mm. You may say, why do you need 10? Mm. Sir, I have as many cranes to get, as many equipments to install. So, 5 is not going mm. to suffice. Give me 10. The developer is willing to listen to you. Mm. Right? Because... He has his bigger picture in mind. So, private sector may stickiness is there if you are able to prove your caliber. Yes, undoubtedly. So, touch wood, we have almost as many clients with whom we've got the second and then the third and then the fourth job. Hmm. And why so? Because they say, they price is so, ye unke so bhi bhi Haan, ye price agar de di na, to ye, let's finalize mm -hmm. it. That could be your mindset. Assume you are the same developer, mm -hmm. we have performed for you well at one side, mm -hmm. and then even if we have a slightly higher price for you for the next job, you may turn around and say, So, we, I want to give the job to you, but your price is slightly higher, please reduce your price. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then you are willing to give that. So, mm -hmm. private sector works slightly more informally, mm -hmm. but the government is by the line, you stick by the line. Mm -hmm. Uh, when when you bid for these government projects, do you have any specific set of margins? Because recently we talked to an infrastructure company only and they said, okay, even if uh, we are not able to bid for the the L1 thing, we, are, we won't be sacrificing our margins for, a, let's say, new project. Our margins are our prime uh, thing. So, my, if you do not look at the bottom line, any business, mm. I feel you are not doing that business properly. Mm. The ultimate test and taste of any business is in the bottom line. Okay. Now, as a practical businessman, you may say, okay, let me take slightly less over here because I got a slightly better margin on my last job. I can, you know, sacrifice a little over here and take mm. it up over there. That much you can play around. And that much also is in a listed company, hmm. not a one-man show. Hmm. In a listed company, like at ours, each and every job as before it goes out, first of all, even when a tender comes out, it goes to what is called an RMC, which is called a Risk Management Committee. Okay. 
this committee actually sees whether we should bid for that job or not. Mm. Leave aside private sector, even today in the government sector, lots of jobs are bid out without their financial closure happening. Okay. They will assume that the money will come to mm -hmm. them over the course of the time or by the time. Now you have to be you have to be cautious, you have to be aware of where you are putting it. Got it. And in the private sector also, the margins have to be discussed, declared before it goes out. Yes, you are okay. flexible, hmm. but you cannot do without a margin. Sir, coming to your order book, as of quarter one, financial year 2025, this June, your order book stands at 8800 crores. What percentage of this order book do you see materializing in, let's say, one to two years? Materializing, you mean like converting into yeah. uh, billing? Yes, yes. We ended up 24 hmm. with around about 2000 crores. Okay. Little like that. Hmm. We have a projection of a 25% CAGR for the next few years. Okay. And that is the bare minimum that we will do. Hmm. That is the bare minimum that the client will demand us to do. Hmm. You cannot sit on that order book and not convert it into that. So this is the general projection of what we, we will do with our order books. You have given the new order book guidance of 3000 crores, right? Hmm. But till now you have only been able to get 250 CR. So what is your strategy to so achieve the 3000 I think uh, Q1 we actually did more than 250. Okay. And the reason why you are not reading the uh, correct inflow or we are not being uh, we are not publishing the correct inflow see we have a huge job at uh, mara okay where tata projects and capacity are redeveloping the whole bdd okay now that is not taken into our order book okay that is separate hmm. now that jv awards works to us okay for example just because unless and until we do not get it into our order book i cannot take the jv order book into mm -hmm. my order book on a standalone basis mm -hmm. so now almost 850 or 900 crores of orders have been given to us from the jv we were we were already awarded it on the first level mm -hmm. but the actual doing level comes now so we are straight mm -hmm. away now at 14 1500 crores today okay got it and there is a very, very, very robust pipeline of jobs being bid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I may say with a lot of confidence that 3,000 we should easily get to. Okay. So, um, talking again about the coming to the segregation between public and private sector, you said 70% of your projects mm -hmm. right now are in public sector. Yes. So, when you started like when you came in for IPO in 2017 this number was negligible yeah. so what triggered that shift because people usually refrain from going into government sector because of the a lot of formalities and as you said you have to stick to the numbers you have to stick to the deadlines so, so I'll give you I'll, mm -hmm. I'll take two minutes on that so when we started like I said the first jobs came on your face value mm -hmm. and then as we delivered they started giving us the second job they started giving us the third job by the time we were five years into 2017 at the time of the IPO, we had finished some jobs. Hmm. We were doing some more jobs. We had a very robust pipeline, uh, order book of close to 4,000 if I'm not mistaken, plus or minus at that time also. But the government sector, like I said, demands that you should have a pre-qualification. Hmm. You should have X number of jobs of 30, 40%, X number of 80%. X number of 60% before you can bid. Mm. The completion certificates that we were carrying with us at the point in 2017 mm -hmm. were such that we were not being able to bid for the bigger government jobs. Okay. It is only post that that we came into a situation that we could bid for the bigger government jobs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I may say that the ILFS issue as well as COVID, hmm. where real estate took a downturn, hmm. showed to us 
that government jobs are very strong in their cash flows and government jobs are also very uh, strong in their demands and volume mm. so there was a uh, and there was a lot of opportunity i mean there were today you open up my bd uh, excel sheet and i think uh, 70% of the jobs over there are government jobs government jobs happening in it parks happening in tamil nadu data centers happening over here hospitals happening in orissa assam katak bhubneshwar haryana all over the country there is this huge humongous amount of government jobs there so uh, the conditions have come today that yes we are in a position to bid for bigger government jobs yeah. we are seeing that there is strong uh, traction in the execution of those government jobs the government today is also very very keen that the jobs that it tenders out yeah. gets completed and today any contractor of a decent standing should understand that his money can only be made if his job is completed in time mm. because it's an epc yeah. contract you have already said i will do this work for x amount of money now assuming you don't do it in that amount of time you are only going to have a cost overrun which is going to hit you mm -hmm. nobody else and maybe get saddled with the penalties yeah. also from the client so the way this new uh, epc contracting mode has come out has also put a lot of uh, enthusiasm into the contractors to start delivering fast hmm. has rera guidelines made any difference oh yes rera guidelines have made a huge amount of difference rera guidelines have made a difference that a uh, the private sector client is keen that his job finishes in time mm -hmm. yes it is also the demand of the industry mm -hmm. and the situation today that people are wanting their houses quicker and their flats be quicker b the monies of the job particular project stay in that particular project so there is no longer a case where uh, the private sector uh, client mm -hmm. has uh, moved money to another project he cannot do that now it stays in that project mm -hmm. so if you do the work you are bound to get paid in time so when did you do your uh, first government project and i think the spot on was happening earlier okay. we were doing some metro stations and some mm -hmm. something earlier but i think the big one started happening around about post covid hmm. so have you seen any difference in the structure of how government pays you and how the private sector uh, pays you for the projects because people usually refrain from going into government projects because of the uh, payment structure thing only oh i, I have think have you faced any issues i i think that is uh, that is a thing of the past now hmm. today if the uh, there is a financial closure to the project the government is sitting on the money the project is sitting on the money with itself and uh, pro payments happen well within the time frames of uh, what is uh, if you do the job properly they will pay properly okay. so so talking about the real estate sector real estate sector has a very high gestation period in terms of time as mm -hmm. well as the money involved so can you explain how does the line of credit that is loc and bank guarantee work here so uh, in the private sector okay by the time developers actually buy that land mm. and actually tender it out mm. there are humongous amount of approvals that they need to go through okay. you know land use trees drawing approval mm -hmm. you know fire a b c i think there would be a list that would be mm. a couple of pages long that they would have to go through mm. by the time it actually comes to tendering stage and today you know rera rules are such that you cannot even sell out a project start selling a project till you have not actually you know launched it officially okay. hmm. so you cannot just say ke maine ek pre project socha pre launch is no no longer happening mm -hmm. so they go through a huge amount of investment into the project hmm. land approvals etc drawings designing before they can actually come to a stage where we get a tender okay and then we come around and say look we need 10% advance to start mm -hmm. the work so their cash flows are you know they have they have to have their financial closure in place mm -hmm. speaking from a contractor's perspective a lot of the material that we do buy has to match the cash flow which is coming in from the client mm -hmm. 
which means that suppose the client says i'm going to pay you in 60 days time okay now a lot of the material has to be paid up front hmm. today you cannot buy steel from tata yeah without paying the money up front to tata mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right that's that's a that's how the industry is op- operating so what do you do in a case like that you have to have your own banking limits in place mm. by which you say that yes i am willing to give you a letter of credit and then you start operating now look at the other side of it you are going to a, a, a client and saying i want 10% advance so the client might just turn around and say okay give me a bank guarantee for taking that advance so i need to have the limits mm-hmm. of my bank guarantees to do that mm-hmm. so today if i may say as far as capacity is concerned we have a very very robust banking limits in place most of our banking limits are what we call non fund based Okay. which means that it is either an lc or a bg that we are using lc and bg are lc is like you buy steel from tata you give a letter of credit to okay, tata okay okay bg yeah. is like you might take a client an advance from a particular client and issue a bank guarantee yeah, to okay it. so you are there those are non fund based limits okay which means no fund is actually being demanded by the bank yeah. a very small amount of you know uh, cc limit that is being used and that is also very minor in the bigger picture of mm. things uh very recent uh, so sbi is our head of the consortium of banks okay. just as a matter of information and sbi has just sanctioned another 150 crores of limits to us in addition to what we already have so we today sit on very robust uh, banking limits mm-hmm. another thing that uh, bgs are required for is that say from each bill the client deducts some retention okay which he says that once you have completed the job i will pay you that money one year after that mm. so that your work is okay mm. we tell them okay why do you want to hold the money for it you hold mm. a bank guarantee and you pay us the money mm. so that is called money for retention okay. uh, uh, sorry a bank guarantee for retention mm. now such bank guarantees can also be issued because now we have a, a humongous amount of free banking limits available Mm-hmm. and all those clients who had deducted 5% from us for their retentions are now being able to release it to us okay so how does the liability work in case there is a delay in the project delivery in the sense uh let's say you were supposed to complete the project let's say uh, by end of next year but you are not able to deliver it so how does the bank or liability like on what basis okay, the so liability decided you are a contractor anyways in the end so the delay mm-hmm. is calculated or uh, ascertained mm-hmm. by the fact whether it is delay on the part of the client or on part of the contractor let's say on the part of the contractor so touch wood till now yeah. we have not got into a situation mm-hmm. where delays on part of the contractor mm-hmm. have been put into place at the end of the project okay we may have had delays where we were supposed to complete x amount by a particular time of the project and hum uske thode se niche reh gaye but then by the end of the project we have covered up so we are fine in the bigger mm-hmm. picture that is what the clients can say that it's a milestone based payment mm-hmm. we will go till this milestone you should complete as much work but if you don't complete the whole thing in time then we will hold it so we have managed to go a little low over here but managed to cover up at the end of the day so wherever there is delay on account of the client then there is what is called an extension of time okay. then there is what is called a escalation matrix which is put into place mm. and an escalation matrix which is ascertained in the official uh, workings of the government mm. are the basis on which plus and minuses can be given okay. now even in the private sector to mitigate the risk that we carry with us mm. for say steel cement okay. rmc etc etc mm. we then say that we will put a base price in the tender okay so we will say that let's put a base price of 50000 rupees for steel mm. if the steel goes at 52000 please pay us 2000 rupees more mm. if the steel that month comes for 48000 please deduct 2000 that is your policy for mitigating the risk of raw material fluctuation for all raw material so if you take steel cement Uh, RMC out of mm. the picture, you have almost mitigated eighty percent of your cost of mm. the project. And then uh, for labor, yeah. you have a system in place. 
either at the start of the project you say that okay this is how my labor will move or you have your government related uh, so when you have such comforts with you mm. to a large extent your risks are mitigated and mm. taken care of and at that point of time the banks are also comfortable with you working mm. so since we are discussing the um, aspects of the balance sheet and profit and loss statement we just discussed about the cost we have seen significant uptick in your revenue what have been the factors for the same so i would say the first thing is that the team has to be credited by turning around the revenues of the company mm-hmm. across board from all sides from the supervisor level till the project director level to everyone sitting at the head office everyone has so to speak slogged it off to get to where we are there is a constant monitoring by the senior management mm. but monitoring is just half the picture mm. actual delivery also happens by the soldiers who are there at the front and they have delivered to that extent we are also very uh, you know confident to say that this is the start of the story mm. because like what you just said that the order book is already there yeah it has to be just converted into work done and the clients are sitting with the money and getting after you that do more work if you can do more work we are willing to pay you if today you are saying you can do only 10 crores if you do 15 i am willing to pay you 15 crores that one so today even the clients are of that mood because a the environment in the industry and in the country is such mm-hmm. that uh, it is upbeat as far as these segments are concerned okay so talking about your debt position so your debt position has remained same more or less in the recent years right but at the same time we have seen growth in your order book and people say that india is next china in terms of infrastructure right but we all know what is the situation in china right now we have seen failure and bust of companies like country garden and evergrande that was because of the over construction that did that they did and that over construction was fueled by debt yeah. do you see similar story panning out in indian with indian companies too so let me put it this way debt is a double edged sword mm. you cannot get growth without debt but you have to be very cautious on how much debt you can sustain mm. that debt has to be addressable by the cash flows of the company mm. and if that debt is such that at one point of time you cannot manage the repayment then it is going to eat you up it is very simple you may take it from the smallest level of any one individual to a company mm. it works on the same principle that if i can take a debt and not pay back the debt then it's going to just the interest is always going to mm-hmm. keep on mounting so uh, as an organization amongst rohit rahul and myself we are very touchy about debt mm. the moment there is any debt which is increasing in the company we kind of are you know we have our eyes ears everything is open that mm. it is debt we are talking about we have an internal goal to become net debt free i may not want to put a timeline to it but mm. very soon we want to become net debt free mm. which is something fantastic if you talk about how construction companies operate because construction companies do operate on debt mm-hmm. to a large extent so uh, being net debt free is where we are actually aiming at and uh, the day that happens i'm sure i'm going to call all of you up and tell you that we are net debt free yeah uh sir talking about your expansion plans you have recently constructed a data center for bsnl i believe yes and you have done a few projects in gift city too yes. since gift city is an upcoming sector yes. what do you have in mind for the area so uh these are some of the cutting edge mm. uh building construction works which are coming out data centers mm. hospitals mm. these are gift city works gift city is just one area but there are umpteen of those areas which are coming out we are doing their head, head offices then we have bid for more works in that same area now okay. and coming down to these look at it from a perspective that a standard retail or uh, residential construction is 3 4000 rupees a square feet okay 
the moment you take it to a hospital, all of a sudden you start talking about seven, eight thousand rupees a square feet. Mm. The moment you take it to a data center, mm. you talk about eleven, twelve thousand rupees a square feet. And the interesting part for us is that almost the same amount of labor, mm. it doesn't increase yeah. in the same ratio. Mm. If you are doing eleven thousand rupees a square feet for a data center. You will not increase your labor at that same ratio as what true, you would do, true, true. because most of the labor comes into that three, four thousand mm-hmm. rupees. The balance, if you are putting in a server or you are putting in an air conditioning system, your labor does not increase because it's very capex heavy mm-hmm. for the uh, client. So that is somewhere where we want to uh, graduate to, okay. because that will multifold add to the revenues of the organization and the profitabilities. Do you see uh, any expansion in terms of geographical area too? So, where are you currently concentrated? Like, so, are there any particular cities? Uh, we, a few on? years ago, we had what was called of a head office and a branch office concept. Hmm. We have removed that concept now. Okay. We have only an HO concept and a site concept, okay. and every site works like a spoke to the HO. Hmm. So, as long as the projects are uh, of a certain size. Profitable hmm. in geographies that are safe with hmm. clients who have, you know, so to hmm. speak, close their financial closure. We are willing to work across the country. We are building jobs in Tamil Nadu. We are building jobs in Haryana, Punjab. People are now getting tenders to us for Jammu Kashmir. Hmm. So uh, the east, humongous amount of work which is happening. The new two states of uh, you know, Jhar of uh, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. Bihar over there, there's a huge amount of works happening. Okay, so eighty uh, percent, eighty-five percent of your revenues, I believe, come from real estate projects, and in that eighty-five percent, it's like divided between high-rise buildings and super high-rise buildings. Question one: Can you explain the difference between high-rise buildings and super high-rise buildings? So high-rise is something that you would call from anything above fifteen story to thirty thirty-five stories. Okay. So there is no clear line which says this is mm-hmm. a super high-rise. Mm-hmm. So. Anything above 35, 40 will be classified as super high rise. But the super high rise, the moment you get into that from a construction perspective, demands certain uh, technologies that you should have so as to actually construct it. Just as a very simple case in point, if I was to construct a 15, 20 story building and I was to have an passenger elevator which was to get my labor up and down mm. it would operate at a certain speed okay if i was to use that same elevator for a 40 story or a 70 story building it would be lunch time by t- time my labor goes up and it would be end of day by the time the labor yeah. comes down mm. because well, it has to operate at a much faster mm. speed and you have to have those equipments with you mm. you have to have the technology of the form work to actually do maybe three slabs a month mm. or four slabs a month because if you don't do it, then an 80 story building by casting one slab a month will take 80 months to do. So that will never happen. You have to have that technology with you for the mm-hmm. kind of form work to say, no, I will do three slabs a month, four slabs a month, finish the slabs in two years time for an 80 story building. Mm-hmm. So that is where the uh, mindset of super high rise and uh, high rise comes in. Uh, I would say the revenue which is coming in is coming in, yes, from real estate as well as from uh, government sector. And uh, I think over the next few quarters, the government sector turnover is also going to go up substantially. Why is that the case? Because our jobs are such. Hmm. Because jobs like Sidco, Mara, uh, the hospitals that we are doing for the government sector, they are demanding that we do. Just as a case, we are about to hand over one hospital in uh, Borivali, MCGM. Mm -hmm. At the, we are in the last few months of the project. Mm -hmm. Each month, we pump in 15 to 20 crores Mm -hmm. worth of equipment over there. Medical operation theatres are going in, air conditioning systems are going in, pipeline for gas, uh, medical gas pipeline is going in. Mm -hmm. So all these high value items are going in now. And so a humongous amount of turnover is coming out from those kind of places. Got it. Sir, uh, we have seen this real estate prices, be it any apartment. Let's take the case of Gurgaon only. If you know the Camellia's building, yes, the, the flats go there go for like one, 100, 150 plus CR. So do you really think it is a bubble or are the prices here to stay? 
So I would say, I would give it the answer in two parts. First, real estate prices are always cyclical. Hmm. So given the fact that I have much lesser hair on my head, the fact is that I have gone, I have seen at least three or four cycles of real estate going up and down. There would be some time where people would say, you know, around about 2004, 5, hmm. Aray, kya price ho gai? Bhar yehi price. In 2008, hmm. 10, everything turned down. Hmm. And now again, we are saying the same thing. It's a fantastic price. It is here to stay. Mm. And then I'm sure there is a cycle which is around the corner because that is the uh, that is the way in which the industry is operated. When the going is good, there is an oversupply of material and then suddenly there is a humongous oversupply and people will say, hey, I need to sell it and it is not going off at the same Adding price. Adding to that, uh, today only I was reading a report by Morgan Stanley where they said, no, India has no bubble hai nahi because it's... Um, it's fueled by the consumerism which is right india, high income growth. but at the same time credit is also there no debt is yeah. increasing in india yeah. private debt is at all time high yeah. so that is also the case so you think it's a bubble so i think some segments or some markets are a bubble hmm. but in the same way i would say that some markets and micro markets the prices have now become realistic hmm. i can tell you an example we were making Bharti world mark in sector 65 in Gurgaon. Okay. It is a Bharti real estate development. Mm. Just next door to it is an MR development, mm. which they had constructed. And they were selling it at 5,500 rupees or 6,000 rupees a square feet. Mm. And they were finding difficulty in selling it. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, just bang opposite that, there is DLF Arbor. And DLF Arbor, people were jumping over each other to buy at 18, 20,000 rupees a square feet. It is the same road. It is just across the road. Hmm. But prices which they were unable to sell at 2, 3, 4 years earlier are now the norm over there. Hmm. And if you look at it, for a developer to construct at 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 is unsustainable. Even the NOIDA rates of the micro markets were unsustainable. A developer wants to sell at 5,000 rupees. People like us will come up and say, sir, we need 2,500 to construct. The person who owns the land will come and say, I want, sir, 1500 rupees for my land. What is left for the poor developer to construct with? Now, when the prices are stabilizing at 18,000 or 15,000, that is the genuine, well, give or take a few mm -hmm. uh, percentage points here or there, that is the genuine stability of the market at which they want. Because the down the line material prices, labor rate prices are such that this is what the end price should be. 100 crores is a different matter, but mm. this is what the German yeah, price should got be. Got it, got it. So, okay, talking, uh, we have talked about everything. So, talking about capacity in Graf, where do you see the company going in, let's say, 10 years? What is your vision for the company? Our vision is to be the most efficient building construction company in the country. Full stop. There is efficiency across construction and the more you get into it, you will see pockets of inefficiencies in some areas, mm. be it internally, be it externally. And that is what senior management and senior people in the company have to do and monitor and make it more efficient. Yes, efficiency has to come from labor and at that point of time, which is one of the major issues which is plaguing the industry today, at this point of time, you have to get newer technologies that technology has to give you far more efficiency into mm. your working so that you could deliver at a faster speed and the faster you deliver the your bottom line is going to be better thank you for joining us today thank you it for was, taking uh, time out pleasure. of your schedule thank you. To